Hi, I'm Cressel Anderson. This is Maker Size. In this episode, we'll make a lot of progress on the tailstock. We will make the tailstock pattern, bake a sand core, cast the tailstock, and mount it on the lathe. The first part in casting the tailstock involves preparation of a core box and core plate. I made the core box from two halves of plywood. I used dowels to align the two halves and I cut a slot down the center. The slot is used to guide a drill bit and I use a spade bit to drill a long hole. The drill bit isn't long enough to go through the entire pattern so I have to flip it. The slot guides the point of the drill bit. Both holes align well because of this slot. After I had the core box made, I sanded some draft on the side of one of the pieces and I used that as the pattern for the core plate. The first time I molded up the pattern, I forgot to leave myself a method for extracting the pattern. I normally use threaded inserts and screws to extract the part. The second time, I noticed that my sand was too dry and the core part didn't turn out well at all. During the third molding attempt, I actually look like I know what I'm doing. The core box is formed from the two pieces of wood and that's used to make the core. And then what I'm casting is a core plate which is used to bake the core. After I had the mold prepared, I took it over next to the kiln I've started using magnesium sulfate or Epsom salts to degas the aluminum. It seems like there are crystals still in the molten metal because you can hear them crackling as I'm pouring the part as well as the ingots from the leftovers. Let me know if you have any ideas about why those crystals are still crackling. I cleaned up the core plate off camera and then I headed to the kitchen to cast the core. I used sand, flour, molasses, and some water to make the mixture for the core. I initially had problems when trying to mold the core in the core box and so I went back to the shop and I put a coat of shellac. And the idea there is that the shellac would prevent the core sand from sticking to the core box. The technique that I finally settled on was to sprinkle a little bit of flour on the core box. Then I fill the core box with sand and I ram it down with the rod. Then I tap the core box, open it gently, and transfer it to the core plate. The first time I did this, the sand core baked really nicely, but it was hard as a rock, and it stuck to the core plate. I pretty much had to hammer it out of the core plate. The first one failed, so I had to try again. Big thanks to thriftylittlemom.com. My wife runs that blog, and she courteously let me prepare this core in her kitchen. Send somebody you know to visit her site. She also gave me a great tip for using aluminum foil to line my aluminum core box. That made extraction of the baked core much easier. When I pulled it out of the oven, voila, it comes right out. Thanks, thrifty little mom. I followed the book and I split three quarter inch pine stock to make five sixteenths inch stock. I ran it through the planer a few times to make it flat and then I proceeded to lay out the pattern I used brad nails to attach the two vertical parts of the pattern. That way any sanding or shaping that I did on one side would be pretty easy to duplicate on the other. Then I pulled out the pins and made the base. Once I finished the sides, I noticed that the dimensions that the book calls for didn't align with my headstock. The pattern was offset to the back by about half of an inch. I had to make a second set that's shifted a little bit towards the front of the lathe. I put all the pieces together and then I fabricated the back. Glued it up and pinned it in. 
And then I had to work on the round part of the tailstock. This will be the part that holds the core. And so I tapered down the ends on the table saw. And then I did it again once I actually figured out my measurements. And I overshot a little bit on the diameter of those uh, core pins. And so I used some tape to get it out to 5 eighths of an inch in diameter. I marked out a cylinder that would become the clamp screw boss on the tailstock. I rounded it out using the sander, marked a smaller diameter circle with a washer, adjusted my bed, and then sanded down the appropriate draft on the clamp screw boss. I attached it to the barrel of the tailstock. And then I used a square to make sure that the clamp screw boss was perpendicular to the draft of the pattern. The finished pattern is slightly taller than the center of the spindle, and that's to allow for shrinkage when casting the part. With green sand, I periodically have to moisten the sand to get it to the right consistency for molding. Molding the tailstock requires a double roll. I first made a false drag. Then I press the part down into the false drag. I put on parting powder and build up the cope as usual. I struck off the cope, rolled the mold the first time, and removed the false drag. Cleaned out the pattern. And then I did something like coping down, except for in this case it's more like dragging up. But at any rate, I wanted the cope to more accurately match the parting line. Then I knock out the false drag and start to mold the actual drag. The cavity on the front of the tailstock made this pattern fairly difficult to mold. I ended up attempting to make the mold several times. The first attempt failed because I forgot to do the second roll and I pulled the drag off the top instead of the cope. The second attempt just really wouldn't separate very easily, so I tried to flip it on its side, which still didn't work. Then I kind of went back to the drawing board. I redefined my parting line. I put on some shellac to try and make the pattern a little bit slicker. Then I sanded it and overall improved the pattern. That was the trick I needed to be able to successfully make the second roll and remove the pattern from the mold. After I had the mold halves separated, I used the core that I baked previously and dropped it down into the mold cavity. Then I closed up the mold. I weighed the tailstock base pattern as well as a cast part to determine that I would need 1.3 kilograms of metal to cast the tailstock. I fired up the kiln, skimmed off the dross, and poured the tailstock. After I got it poured, there was some weirdness going on. I think it was due to the core off-gassing or the hollow cavity kind of filling, but <laughs> there was some bubbling going on, and it kind of freaked me out a little bit. I didn't know quite what to make of it. It turned out all right, but it smelled like burned cookies in the garage. Once I took it back to the molding bench to extract the part, I tried to scratch out some of the core sand so as not to contaminate my green sand. And I pried out the part and cleaned it up a little bit. Here you can see it with the pattern in the foreground. I score the part with a hacksaw and use a hammer to knock it loose. Same thing for the end pieces. And then I used a rod to knock the core sand out. Ended up having to hammer it through at the end. I cleaned it up with my sander and a file. And I made a little block so that I could clamp the tailstock to my table saw sled. And that way I could use the table saw to clean up the bottom of the tailstock. It really worked so well on the tailstock base that I thought I would continue that process with the tailstock. Cleaned it up with a chisel and a file. And then I test fit. I needed to open it up just a little bit more on the bottom to allow room for the gib. So I marked it and cut it on the table saw. Cleaned it up. And then test fit with the gib. 
And then I cut the gib to length. I clamped a spare ingot to this piece of scrap and used my router table to cut a slot in it. So now I'm going to try that with the tailstock. I used a small piece of plywood to give me an index surface much like the set overways on the actual tailstock base. And then I clamped the tailstock onto the sled. I used some marks on a piece of tape. Initially I'd put them farther up next to the bit, but then I realized I couldn't see that, so I had to move them to the back of the sled. I raised the bit a little bit at a time, probably about, oh, a sixteenth. Eventually got that slot cut. The fit without the post looked pretty good. Once I put the post in, I could tell there was a little bit of interference, so I had to trim off just a little bit. I used cardboard shims to allow me to set the tailstock a little bit over from where it was on the sled. You think it does? Okay. Oh, buddy, you're getting silly right now. Oh, look at it. Oh. Go with this. Forget about it. No. After I had the tailstock roughly fitting the tailstock base, I cleaned up the bottom of the tailstock. I did this using the sandpaper method from part nine. I drilled and tapped the set over way screws in the front of the tailstock. The back, however, required a little bit more fixturing. I ran out of pointy set screws, so I had to make my own out of a bolt. I marked the tailstock and drilled the gib adjustment screws. I used a 1024 tap held in my drill to tap the gib adjustment screw holes. And I always think it's interesting how the metal deforms on the bottom of a part like this. So I have to clean it up again using the sandpaper method. And you can see how the pads get deformed from tapping. I install the set over way screws and then tighten up the gib adjustment screws clamp the tailstock onto the tailstock base. The set over adjustment screws give you the ability to adjust the tailstock forward and backward on the tailstock base, thereby giving you the ability to cut tapers like a Morris taper on the lathe. I hope this video inspires you to exercise your inner maker. If you like this video, click the like button. Subscribe to Maker Size, check out some of our other videos, and we'll see you next time.